In the last session, we saw the profile of a lukewarm Christian. For today, I want us to look at the profile of a fake boyfriend. That means if you have a boyfriend or if you are someone's boyfriend, I think this is a good evaluation. Well, let's just go through it. Number one, fake boyfriends do what are expected of them. They do them out of obligation. Number two, fake boyfriends give gifts as long as they just pay the minimum. Third one, fake boyfriends don't really love you in particular. They just want a girlfriend. So anyone will do. Number four, fake boyfriends are moved by stories about other men doing radical things for love. But, you know, they are not into that kind of things. Next, fake boyfriends rarely tell others about you. Well, because he's afraid his friends might not like you that much. Number six, fake boyfriends gauge their love for you by comparing themselves to your enemies. Number seven, fake boyfriends do love you, just not as much as they love themselves. Number eight, fake boyfriends think more about life without you than they think about life with you. Nine, fake boyfriends will not take any risks for you. Why? Well, because they might get hurt. And the last one, fake boyfriends see you once a week on Sunday morning and they hope their visit ends as early as possible so that they can be with their friends. Well, I think from this list, well, it's a fictional list, you can see that someone who really loves you would want to do more than that, right? It's just, it's just they, they want to do way more. And it's not just doing those things, but they want to do them. It's not because they have to, but because they want to out of love for you. Now, if you have a boyfriend like that, hmm, I think you need to seriously con reconsider if he's really worth it or not. Now, a profile is a description. It's not a set of commandments like, you know, that, that you have to live by. And it's not the test that if you get 5 out of 10 or 7 out of 10, then you fail or pass. No, rather, a profile, it's like a... It's like showing someone the symptoms or the evidences of what someone who is a fake boyfriend, or in last Sunday's case, a lukewarm Christian is like. You see, it's easy to identify someone who is against God. Someone who hates God, well, someone who doesn't believe in God. There are so many evidences and it's relatively easy to spot them, to identify them. What is harder and perhaps even more dangerous are those who think they are Christians when in fact they are not. They claim to be followers of Jesus Christ. Even they, they can even do a lot of things outwardly, but deep down, they are not really Christians. You say, is it possible to have people like that? Well, Matthew 7, 21 to 23 says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evil doers. Now, just who are we referring to by the term lukewarm Christians? I think it's important for us to identify who are the lukewarm Christians. Now, after hearing last week's message on the profile of a lukewarm Christian, if you are convicted and you say to yourself, oh my, it seems like I'm lukewarm. Uh, I, how, how can I be like this? I ought to love God more. He loves me so much and I think I'm not good enough for Him. I want to go all out for God. I want to love God more. Now, if that's you, then you are not a lukewarm Christian because those are signs of a genuine believer because you want to. When, when you are encouraged, when, when you are told that you don't love God enough, what stirs up within you is a desire to want to grow in your commitment to Him. You want to love Him more. You want to know Him more. You want to be even more committed to Him. For, for all of us, we know that none of us can be good enough. We, knowing how much God loves us, we will never love God enough. But there is that desire to keep striving. And those are evidences of someone who is not a lukewarm Christian, but rather they are signs that you are a genuine believer, a disciple of Christ 
growing in your faith and love and knowledge of God. On the other hand, as we went through the profile last Sunday, describing a lukewarm Christian, if you feel after hearing that, you say, hey, what's wrong with, with someone like that? You know, and I'm like that. You know, almost every other Christian I know is like that. Nothing wrong with that, right? Why would I want to or need to do more? I'm already saved. At least that's what they tell me. I don't have to do anything, right? And besides, I don't feel like I want to do it, and I don't really want to do it. You see, lukewarm Christians have no desire to be committed to the Lord. They, they, they are okay with that. They're okay with, you know, just, just like this. You know, I'm, I, I'm saved anyway. I know I'm saved because they told me I'm saved, and therefore, I'm okay. So lukewarm Christians habitually live in a state wherein they, they don't want to be committed and they feel that they're okay because they, they are saved and therefore they don't have to do anything. This is where Revelations 3.15 to 18 comes in. Revelation 3.15 to 18 says, I know your deeds that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are, there's the word, lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I'm rich, I have acquired wealth, and I do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, so you can become rich, and white clothes to wear, so that you can cover your shameful nakedness and solve to put on your eyes so you can see. The lukewarm are described here as wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. But the worst part is they don't know it. They don't know it. That is why they don't want to buy gold, the refined gold from the Lord, because they think they're already rich. I already have it. Why do I need to buy? They don't want to get white clothes to wear because they don't realize that they are shamefully naked. They don't want to buy medicine to put on their eyes because they don't know that they are blind. You see, those with LWS, meaning lukewarm syndrome, I like to call it, Lukewarm syndrome, LWS, is deadly not because it will kill you. Rather, it's deadly because this syndrome shows that you are not really alive, that you are really dead. Lukewarm Christian, this is a problem. Lukewarm Christians think they are alive when in fact they are dead. So they're dead, but they don't know that they're dead. So how do we prevent LWS? Make sure that we understand fully what it means to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe it's because we have a wrong concept or, or we, we just don't, we don't understand it, we don't get it. What does it really mean to believe in the Lord, Savior, Jesus Christ? And what does it involve? I think there are these four things here that we need to make sure so that we do not become lukewarm Christians. Number one, believing in Jesus means believing who he says he is. You see, to believe someone means that you trust him to be who he says he is. And so believing in the person of Jesus Christ is more than just believing the facts, believing the, 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 the nature, the stories, what he did, uh, where he came from, who he is. More than that, it is believing in the person of Jesus Christ. Meaning, it's, sim it's not simply agreeing with the gospel message, the gospel presentation. Rather, believing, meaning faith, is believing in the person of Jesus Christ. It's believing in Him as presented in the gospel. So you believe Him so much that you're willing, therefore, you know, if you believe Him to be who He says He is, then you are fully convinced and you will be committed to want to follow him. So you cannot, it's, it's, so it's not a blind faith. It's not, you know, okay, I'll just, I'll just do it. I'll just, I'll just, you know, and, and just accept whatever. We believe him to be who he says he is. We need to know exactly who he is so that we believe in the right savior. But it's more than just a doctrines. It is trusting in him to be who he says he is. I think this principle is obvious in a doctor-patient relationship. 
If you don't believe in the doctor, no matter how many diplomas or certificates he displays on the wall of his clinic, if you don't believe him, then you will not follow his prescriptions. You will not allow him to practice on you the procedures that he described, that he prescribes for you. You must trust your doctor in order for this relationship, this doctor-patient relationship to work. In the same way, believing in Jesus is when you believe in him to be who he says he is, more than just the doctrines. The right doctrines lead to the right faith, but the right faith is more than just the doctrines. It is believing in the person of Jesus Christ. And, and once you believe, once you start to believe, this believing, the, once you believe, the belief will not end. Okay, it's, it's not that, okay, I once believed, I don't need to believe anymore. No, once you believe in him, then you continue to believe. Okay, that's what, that's what it means. Once you believe, you will never stop believing in him. You will continue to believe. Once you believe, you will always believe. So that's the first one. To believe in him means that you trust him to be who he says he is. Secondly, to believe in Jesus means committing to follow him. This is similar to saying I do during a wedding ceremony. Now, what's expected of the commitment of the bride and the groom when they come up and they say I do to each other? You know, I often like to tease the bride and the groom just before they say I do. You know, I would ask them several times, are you sure? Are you sure you want to go through with this? Now, it may sound like that I am uh, teasing them, that I'm joking, well, because all the guests want to, uh, they, they want to attend the banquet later on. But I'm quite serious, actually, because the I do's, it, it's very simple, okay? It's just I do. But the I do's actually are very heavy commitments. You are committing the rest of your life to be totally devoted to this one person. So it is actually a very heavy commitment. If someone were to tell you, all oh, weddings are, ah, it's nothing, you, it's okay, you just go through with the ceremony. It's okay if you don't want to live together, you know, as husband and wife afterward. It's okay for now if you still want to entertain all the other girlfriends that you have. It's okay for now if you're not 100% committed to your husband. You will say, what? what? What kind of a ceremony is that? What kind of a, of a wedding is that? if the bride and the groom are not totally committed to each other. In the same way, if we're not ready to be fully committed, to be 100% committed to our spouse, then I think you would say, well, stop the ceremony, stop the wedding because you're not ready. If you're not ready to be fully committed to the Lord, then you're not ready to believe in Him. Because to believe in Him means that you accept Him as your Lord and Savior, that you believe Him to be who He says He is, and you are ready to be committed to Him fully. The commitment to follow Jesus, therefore, must be all. It must be like totally devoted. Yes, I know, after we, we believe in Him, our faith will continue to grow, okay? And, and there will be ups and downs, of course, just like a husband and wife when they got married, they're, you know, they, they're committed to each other. They are fully committed. It's 100% committed. But there will be ups and downs in the relationship. The important thing is that the relationship is built on the premise of total devotion to each other. Okay, there, there will be ups and downs. But the marriage cannot be built on anything less than total commitment. In the same way, when we believe in Jesus, it is all out devotion. It is all out devoted. Okay, It's not by what we do, but it is your commitment to say, okay, I am committed to following Him. I'm committed to be 100% committed to Him. When people say, can we just you know, get people saved first and then talk about total commitment later? That's exactly the gist of the problem. That, that's exactly where the problem lies. When, when we say, okay, just get them saved and then talk about commitment later on. Because to follow, to commit is exactly what to believe means. You cannot say, I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ without at the same time saying, I believe in him, therefore I commit to follow him. If we expect that of a wedding vow, 
Why do we expect anything less from the vow we make with the Lord? It should be fully dedicated, 100% totally devoted to God. Thirdly, to believe in Jesus results in life transformation. When we believe in Him, it will result in life transformation. When you believe, meaning, as we said, you believe Jesus to be who He says He is and you are committed to follow everything He says, when you believe like that, then your life cannot help but be transformed. If there's no change after you, you say you believe, if there's no transformation, then it means that you did not really believe. If you say you believe, but there's no transformation, it means that you did not really believe. For example, if one day you open the front door and a strange kid suddenly appears and he calls you Papa, and, and you look at him and you say, who are you? I, I don't know you, you're a stranger. What would you do? Well, I'm sure aside from being shocked, the first and most important thing is to figure out, to confirm who in the world is this kid and where is he coming from? Is he really my son? Probably you would want to hear his story, you know, to see if it's even possible, remotely possible. You would want to trace back from his birthday to, to, to a particular time. You want to trace back where he came from, where he's coming from, to see that place, if you have been to that place. You want to know who his mom is and uh, the million dollar question, do you know his mom? And I'm, I'm sure you would check his birth certificate, you know, to, to look at documents. You would want to also uh, check, if possible, check his blood, his DNA, and you would look at his face to see if he's any way looks like you. All these biological identifications, and after all this examination, what are you trying to do? You're trying to ascertain if he's really your son. And then comes the moment of truth. The moment of truth is this. The moment of truth is, do you believe him to be who he says he is? Okay, he says he's your son. And if he is, then what would happen? You see, if you don't believe him, okay, if you don't believe him after everything, you don't believe him, then okay, nothing changes. Your life will go on just the same as before. Of course, I think you want to figure out, okay, you want to figure out who is behind this very bad practical joke. But life as you know it will go on. On the other hand, if you believe him, okay, if you say you believe him, then on that very day that you accept him as your son, then this kid changes everything for you. You cannot say, I believe he is my son, I accept him as my son, but nothing changes. My life will go on as it was. If that's the case, if your life goes on as before, then you actually don't believe. Because if you really believe him to be who he says he is, you cannot help but be changed by who he is in relation to you. When we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, when we believe him to be who he says he is, he is the Lord of Lords, he is the Son of God, he came to die for you and he loves you so very much. If you believe him to be who he says he is, then your life cannot but be transformed. If there is no transformation, no amount of claims, no matter what you say that you believe him, will show, okay, those are the evidences that will show that you actually don't believe. Now again, it's not what you do for him afterwards, okay, if, if you say, okay, he's my son. It's not what, for, what you do for him afterwards that, that makes him your son. Rather, it's because he is your son, therefore you do all those things. In the same way, it's our true relationship with Christ. It's not what we do for Him that will save us, but rather because we believe. Because I believe Him to be my Savior. I believe Him to be my Lord. Therefore, my life will show forth. I, I will do all these things, not for me to be saved, but rather all these things that I do show, they are the evidences that show who am I? Again, so therefore, we, we are saved by grace alone, by faith alone, not by good deeds, not by good works. Rather, the good works show that we are saved. They are the, the signs of life. They are the proof of life of what has happened within us. We're not saved by good works. Rather, we're saved to do good works. So they are the evidences of our faith. 
And the last one, to believe in Jesus is actually a serious commitment. To believe in Jesus is a serious commitment. You see, for a person to come to a saving knowledge and faith in Jesus, it's a big step. In fact, it's one of the most important, if not the most important decision ever. In fact, it's also forever. And with all good intentions to get as many saved as possible, I believe we may have at times unintentionally watered down the gospel message to make believing as easy and risk-free and sanitized as possible so that more people would accept it. And in so doing, I'm afraid that we, and when I say we, I myself included, we have cheapened God's grace. We have made it so lightly. We have reduced the commitment to simply just agreeing with a message, just accepting a set of teachings. Just, just do certain acts or, or say, say a certain prayer and you are saved. I believe we have oversimplified the gospel message to the point that it is no longer the gospel. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying we should not share. We should share. I'm not saying we do not witness. We should witness. We do proclaim the gospel. But since life transformation, the, the transformation within is the work of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, I believe as we share the gospel, as we're witnessing, we cannot short circuit. We, we cannot preempt what the Holy Spirit is doing. What I mean is we must leave the work of transformation to God. We leave that part to God. And we should not be too eager to, to pressure, too eager to assure the person that they are saved even when we actually don't know. Right? Actually, we don't know. We, we, we are not sure if they are saved. And yet how often we want to assure them. And we may be reassuring them too early. Because when someone doesn't fully understand yet what they are committing to, they don't fully get what they are saying yes to, and we assure them too early that they are already saved, that often will create lukewarm Christians. Because they think they're saved, because we assure them that they're saved, when in fact they have not yet fully understood what it means to be committed to Jesus. What does I believe? What does it mean? So what is witnessing? Think about it. What is witnessing? We often equate witnessing to what I would call cold calls. Like, you know, talk to strangers and then ask them if they want to believe or not. Uh, I believe that is only one small part of witnessing. Okay, I'm not saying that's not good. I'm, I'm saying that's only one small part of witnessing. You see, witnessing is much more than that. Witnessing is to testify to the goodness and grace of God of what God is doing in your life, you testify to that using your words, using your life, using your example to lead others to the point that they too would want to believe in Jesus. Because of what they see in you, because of what they heard from you, and because of the work of the Holy Spirit in their heart, they would come to a point where they say, all right, I, I want to trust in Him. I want to believe in Him. And they are ready to commit to Him to want to do whatever He says. And this is best done, if you know this, this is best done how in a small group setting, in a one-on-one -on -one setup. That's the best way for us to witness to someone so that they would come to the point wherein they want to commit, they want to be fully dedicated, and they want to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I know some will say, but pastor, that will take a long time and a lot of efforts. You know, we, we would need for, and, and we would need for that person to really understand the full meaning of belief and be willing to do so. And, and that's going to take months or even years. Well, my answer is yes, of course. That's, that's how it should be. We're telling people, because if you think about it, we're telling people to give up their lives. We're telling people that, that everything that they have, their hopes, their dreams, their future, the very way they live, they're going to commit to the Lord Jesus Christ. They want to believe in Him. And that's a big commitment. And that's something that they should come to the point wherein they will say, all right, I want to do this. Yes, I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is not something that can be done in just minutes. 
and it should not be. We need to make sure that they know exactly what they are signing up for, you know, before they sign on a dotted line, to, so to speak. So we need to help them. We need to continue to witness to them until they come to that point wherein they are ready to want to be fully dedicated to the Lord. And that is what it means to believe. To believe means you are fully dedicated. You want, you are committed to want to follow the Lord. In 1998, I, I wanted to go to the United States with some of our youth leaders to attend a church seminar. But I was denied a US visa. Not once, not twice, but three times. Three times I was denied. I was so disappointed and so angry, not just at the consul who denied me. Yes, it was the same consul who denied me three times. But I was so mad also at God. You know, at that time, I really wanted to go, but, but I was denied entry into the United States. What if, at that moment, I thought, what if the denial is not just denial to enter the United States? What if it's an eternal denial to enter into the kingdom of God, to enter into heaven? By the way, uh, uh, I was granted a U.S. visa 11 years later. But the denial to heaven, there's no second chance. If you're there and you're denied entry, that denial is for eternity. It's an eternal denial. That's a very very long time. And that is why I believe this message is so important. I pray that none of us will say, nah, after I hear that profile, you know, don't push me to do all that. You know, I just want, I just want an easy faith. I just want to, you know, get my ticket to heaven. Don't ask me to be committed and do all that for the Lord. I, I just want to live life my own way. I just live life on my own terms. I'll just remain the same and wait my turn to heaven. You see, to believe in Jesus, to truly believe in Him, changes everything. And if, and if it does not, if it does not change us, then I don't know, did you really believe? And to believe in Him is absolutely the best thing that can ever happen to you. It's actually a joyous moment for you to say yes to the Lord, to want to go all in because you understood that this God, the God of the universe, the Lord of Lord, He wants to be your Savior. He wants to be your Lord. And He loves you so very, very much. And He wants nothing but the best for you. So to believe in Him, to commit your life, to want to follow Him, is actually the best thing that can happen to you. And I hope that all of us will truly come to that point, to truly believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much. We thank you because you are reminding us once again. Our faith in you, it's because of your love for us. It's because of what you have done in us. And therefore, when we come to that point, when we want to be committed to you, when we come to the point of believing in you, we are dedicating our lives fully unto you. Help each one of us truly to believe in you. Help us not to, to rely on ourselves and to think that we are saved when in fact we are not. Help us to truly come to a saving knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and to believe in Him, to believe Him to be who He is and be committed to want to follow Him and be committed to be in this relationship with our Savior so that, so that we can truly be assured and we can truly come before you. Thank you, Lord, for speaking to us. May your spirit continue to convict us and help us to know you, to love you, and to seek you more and more. This is our prayer. In Christ's most precious name we pray. Amen.